In the beginning there was the void, and within this infinite void is the Spirit of God. This Spirit has not manifested anything yet, so the Eye of Horus I'm using here to represent the Spirit of God is not a reality. In other words, essentially God and the Void are one. But obviously I cannot show you God and the Void as one, as they cannot be depicted graphically at the same time. That is the nature of emptiness. At this point, there are no dimensions, or space, and there is no time. There is also only two options available for God. Remain in this state of static omnipresence or begin creating. God will begin creation eventually, however as there is no time, it is irrelevant to ask how long it took to make the decision to begin creating reality. Ok, so now God has decided to begin creation. But before this can happen, God needs to create a canvas on which he is to paint his masterpiece. The first thing that God does is create the three dimensions. It does this by projecting a beam of consciousness from a single point in all six directions front, back, left, right, up and down, in equal measure. Bear in mind that the void is infinite and that distance has not been defined yet, so it does not matter how far these beams are projected from the point, it makes no difference. You must also understand that what I'm showing here graphically is not a reality. That is, the structures being created are not material in any form, they are imaginary lines, they are pure consciousness. You may need to pause or replay this video several times before the implications become apparent to you. At this point, God is halfway to creating space. In order to complete this process, it must define some boundaries, because as I mentioned before, the void is infinite, and if no boundaries are defined, then relative movements of spirits remain impossible. To define some boundaries, all God needs to do is connect the end of every point to the end of every other point. The beauty of this, and indeed the entire process itself, is that God cannot make a mistake. It is simply impossible. Once all the ends are connected, what we have is an octahedron, which if viewed from the correct perspective reveals a hexagram, also known as the Star of David. Now that some boundaries have been defined, relative movements are now possible. The single point of consciousness can now move away from the defined central location, whereas previously there was nothing to move relative to. In the Bible, Eve was supposedly created from Adam's rib. Obviously this has no relevance to the present world, except maybe with unnatural fetus creation techniques. But when this story is compared with the next step in the process, you can begin to appreciate the idea that maybe the Bible is only an exoteric recreation of an older esoteric wisdom. The octahedron is made up of purely straight lines. In sacred geometry, straight lines are considered to be male, and curved lines female. So at this point, what we have is a purely male shape. This is why the Freemasons consider the male to be the generating principle. The next step involves spinning this octahedron in one full rotation around each of the three axes defined previously. Again, no mistake can be made. It does not matter which direction it is spun, or in what order the axes are chosen. The end result will always be that the parameters of a perfect sphere have been traced. Now we have a purely female shape. Eve has now been created from Adam. God has now created a perfect spherical membrane, and once again, it only has two options available. It can either remain static and explore this imaginary shape for all eternity, or it can repeat the process described thus far. The only difference is now God has a reference point, the spherical membrane, on which to repeat the process. It does not matter where spirit chooses on the membrane to begin the process, as it is a perfect sphere, thus all points are identical to each other, it cannot make a mistake. At this point, God only knows how to do two things, projecting an octahedron and creating a spherical membrane, and moving its point of awareness to what is newly created. The next step is described in Genesis in the Bible, and thus the next process is commonly referred to as the Genesis pattern. So God moves to the surface of the newly created spherical membrane, and begins projecting another identical sphere. God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. This has created a very special shape called the Vesica Pisces. This shape can be found twice in your own body, the appearance of the human eye behind the eyelids, and also the lens within the eye which adjusts the focus of light. The significance of this connection demonstrates both a left brain and a right brain idea, and it certainly shocked me when I was first introduced to it. Once again, God only has two options, remain static or project another sphere. To project the third sphere, God moves to what is newly created, 
which is this circle equator created by the two original intersecting spheres. Again, it does not matter where God chooses on this circle as the central point for the third sphere, as all points on this circle are identical. After the third sphere is created, there is only one more rule God follows when creating the rest of the spheres which complete the first stage of this pattern. The rule is, always move to the innermost circle points before projecting another sphere. This results in the process being perfect and prevents a chaotic mess being created. At the creation of each new sphere, more and more patterns, or information, become available, such as the Vesica Pisces mentioned earlier. The patterns contained within after each new sphere is added is far too extensive to cover in detail. All that remains to be said is after seven spheres have been created in a vortex-like motion, what we have as a result is known as the seed of life. This basic pattern lays the foundation for the creation of matter and the universe itself. It also gives rise to a shape known as a tube torus, if the pattern is spun around the central point. This shape is the only one in existence that can fold upon itself. It is also composed of seven equal segments, which can be displayed visually using the seven colours of the visible light spectrum. The seed of life is not the complete pattern. There are two more steps to take, which each reveal yet another layer, and also another new set of patterns and information. Following the rule of, always move to the innermost points before projecting, God creates an additional six circles on top of the existing seed of life pattern. This motion is often referred to as the second vortex motion. This process is repeated once more, the third vortex motion, which finally gives rise to the next new complete pattern known as the flower of life. This pattern is found throughout the ancient world, but the oldest depiction was found at the Temple of Osiris in Egypt, etched into the granite using a process unknown to modern science. Once again, if we proceed through two more vortex-like motions, adding additional circles to the flower of life, eventually we reach the next new complete layer, the final layer as far as it is understood, known as the fruit of life. God has now finished creating the pattern which is used as a template for all material things. Remember, this pattern is still purely imaginary, purely consciousness at this point. You may now be starting to comprehend the basis of the idea that we live in a holographic universe. Everything can be reduced to just two things, structure and consciousness, although obviously even structure is derived from consciousness. It is a funny feeling knowing that you exist as a creation of consciousness, of God, given how solid and real the physical world appears. After the tube torus and vesica pisces, the next thing that can be demonstrated is known as the tree of life, derived from the seed of life pattern. It is most commonly recognised as a mystical concept within Kabbalah, and is a motif in various world theologies and philosophies. In Kabbalah, it is used as a tool to understand the nature of God and the manner in which he created the world out of nothing. The details of this particular study are too complicated to overview briefly at this point. The next form that can be extrapolated is known as the egg of life. If we proceed to the second vortex motion as described in the previous video, and remove all the circles from the seed of life except this central one, we create this new form consisting of eight spheres. This form is three-dimensional, and from our two-dimensional perspective we are unable to see the eighth sphere, which is located behind this central sphere. This pattern is the most balanced and optimum form for eight spheres existing in direct connection with each other. The reason why it is called the egg of life is because nature uses this form in the embryonic creation process of every single living organism on this planet, with no exceptions. Nature chooses this form because it is the most balanced, most harmonious form possible. We now proceed to arguably one of the most important sets of extrapolations, one which can demonstrate visually as well as mathematically the beauty of sacred geometry. If we take the fruit of life layer and extract these 13 circles, what we get as a result is known as the holy archetype, Metatron's cube. This can be imagined as an extension of the egg of life, as there are eight spheres in this central portion, but also an additional sphere attached in perfect alignment to the corner of each one of the eight central spheres. In total, there are 16 spheres in the three-dimensional version of Metatron's cube. It is interesting to note that the parameters of a hypercube, also known as the terasect, can be extrapolated easily from Metatron's cube, and for this reason literally adds another aspect of dimensionality to this particular form. This arrangement of the spheres is geometrically perfect, so adding or subtracting spheres as previously hinted at with the transformation from the egg of life to Metatron's cube has no impact on the integrity of the geometry itself. 
For this reason, you should be able to now comprehend the holographic idea. We have just hinted at a fourth dimensional concept from a three dimensional structure. However, as we cannot directly perceive a fourth dimension, there is little else to mention on this topic at this point. The most widely recognized aspect of Metatron's cube, however, is its relation to the platonic solids. It should be noted that although Plato's name is attached to these forms, it has been discovered that the late Neolithic people of Scotland had platonic solid ornaments made of stone 1,000 years prior to Plato. This obviously creates a big question of where they got this wisdom from, but that is for another line of inquiry, another video series. There are five platonic solids. The tetrahedron, the octahedron, the hexahedron, the icosahedron, and the dodecahedron. What makes these shapes so special is that the faces, edges and angles are all congruent and that each one can fit perfectly inside a sphere with all the corners touching. There are no other shapes in existence which satisfy these conditions and that is what makes these shapes so special. These five platonic solids also form pairs, known as jewels. The hexahedron and the octahedron make up one pair and the icosahedron and the dodecahedron make up the other. The tetrahedron is the odd one out, as it is a jewel with itself. What this means is that one can be created inside the other, known as nesting, by connecting all the midpoints of all the faces. This process can be repeated to infinity in either direction, and demonstrates very clearly the idea of symmetry in a very unique way. It is also possible to nest each platonic solid within the other four without error, however the symmetry is not as perfect as it is with the jewels. So, how do the platonic solids relate to Metatron's cube? If we take the two-dimensional form of 13 circles for the sake of simplicity, and using straight lines, connect the centre of every circle to the centre of every other circle, we end up with this pattern. What this has created is the parameters for the two-dimensional flattened versions of the platonic solids, with the exception of the dodecahedron. The dodecahedron is special in that it requires one to rotate the three-dimensional version of Metatron's cube by a ratio of phi in order to reveal the missing lines. However, one can add the additional lines on the two-dimensional version by dividing these sides by the golden ratio and adding in the extra lines accordingly. It is perhaps for this reason that Plato and Pythagoras shielded others from the dodecahedron, as this particular aspect of wisdom is quite unique and maybe they felt it would reveal too much if taught. Each platonic solid is also associated with an element although these connections I consider to be subjective at this point. The ether, for example, is known to be a formless, omnipresent, immaterial substance and thus being associated with a geometric shape doesn't quite work. It has been postulated that the dodecahedron is actually associated with the heavens, or cosmos, and interestingly cosmologists in France and the US suggested that the universe may actually be in the shape of a dodecahedron based upon their study of the cosmic microwave background radiation. There are some extra shapes which can be extrapolated from the five platonic solids. These are known as the Archimedean solids, of which there are 13 in total. Seven of these can be obtained by truncating one of the platonic solids. Truncating essentially means cutting off the corners of an existing shape to reveal a new face for the previously existing vertex. Two of the Archimedean solids can be obtained by the opposite process, expanding the platonic solid. The final two are created by snubbing a platonic solid which is done by moving the faces outward whilst twisting. These shapes and the processes just described require more explanation but I do not have enough time in this video to do so. I have saved this final extrapolation for last. It is known as the divine proportion or the golden ratio and like the mathematical value of pi is an irrational number. This means the exact value can never be fully determined as the creation of this number results in an infinite series of non-repetitive digits. The most simple way to demonstrate the golden ratio is to use the Vesica Pisces layer of nature's first pattern, although there are many other opportunities to demonstrate it such as with the platonic solids. I will now show you the process of calculating the golden ratio from the beginning. We start with a single length with a value of 1, and using this as the radius we trace a circle. The diameter of the circle obviously has a value of 2. The next step is to simply create another circle of identical size with its central points located anywhere on the circle defined previously. 
This creates the Vesica Pisces shape as explained in the previous video. If we add in some guidelines, the rest of this calculation should be very easy to comprehend. We can now construct a simple right angled triangle using the values of 1 and 2. 1 for the height and 2 for the width. The hypotenuse length can be calculated using trigonometry. Using this length, which has a value of 0.5, we rotate it around this point to trace another circle. Where this circle intersects the hypotenuse, we have the final parameter for the golden ratio, which is this newly created length along the hypotenuse. We have now successfully demonstrated this geometric relationship, known as the golden ratio, and have an approximate number of 1.618 as its value. This can also be used to construct what is known as the golden spiral, and is most commonly recognised in the Nautilus shell. The golden spiral can be approximated using a series of numbers known as the Fibonacci series, 